So what is Cobra? I can remember David Cameron assuring us all, sort of very macho-like, that we can all rest assured because he called a meeting of Cobra. Well, Cobra is the acronym for uh, the Civil Contingencies Committee, which is a British cabinet committee chaired by the Home Secretary. Um, and uh, it deals with major crises such as terrorism and natural di uh, disasters. And uh, it's referred to as COBRA. And it's called COBRA because it's named after the room they meet in, which is called Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. Uh, so what happens is uh, these people, the Security and Res uh, Resilience Committee, meet in a room and clearly, you know, if there's an incident, they'll discuss that. Uh, but you can sort of go online and find the documents that they've published, which are pretty bland. Um, Cobra uh, is, uh, you know, about as sexed up as the dossier on weapons of mass destruction or the Donald Trump golden shower uh, dossier uh, so-called in the USA. Um, so I'm not going to read that but uh, what I did do was look at the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament uh, which is the committee of MPs this is the Wikipedia article and down here you can see who's who's on it uh, Sir Malcolm Rufkind was the chairman until Septem uh, Fe February 2015 the chairman is now Dominic Grieve QCMP you can see Gisela Stewart sits on it she's retiring this parliament I don't think she's running Angus Robinson he's the SNP um, leader in the House of Commons um, I like him actually. And so uh, here we go. Um, they produced, uh, the, on, on, there are websites for these things. So here you see, this is GCHQ, this, this bu uh, building here, that's in Cheltenham. This here is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in, on the South Bank, that's MI6's headquarters. And this here is MI5, which is on um, Millbank, on the embankment, just down from the House of Commons. Uh, so that's where these different agencies live. And this is the committee. So here are the faces. There's Gisela Stewart, the Right Honourable Keith Simpson. There's Angus Robertson. These other, other, other people. So this is the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament. Now, they produce an annual report. Um, these are all going back. So I thought I'd take a look at the 2015-2016 one. And uh, it's quite short. It's only 21 pages long. Um, and again, I mean, it's all sort of just, a, you know, fairly dry stuff. But this is quite interesting. Lethal strikes in Syria. Okay, so item 13 on page 7. On 7th of September 2015, the Prime Minister announced that three UK nationals in Syria had been killed by two separate targeted drone strikes. On 21st of August 2015, the RAF had targeted and killed Rayad Khan in the vicinity of Raqqa in Syria. Two other individuals, both described as Daesh associates, were also killed. One of these, Rahul Amin, was also a UK national, and on 24th of August, Junaid Hussain, another UK national, a close associate of Khan, was killed in the US airstrike in the Raqqa area. And then on 13th of November 2015, UK national Mohammed Enwazi, known as Jihadi John, was killed uh, in a further airstrike in Raqqa. So, um, then... I basically just searched those different names, and so here they are. Jihadi John, a British Arab believed to be a person seen in several in videos produced by Islamic State. Uh, I mean, you can do a search yourself and get all these same things. Um, then 
Here's another one, Junaid Hussain. Junaid Hussain was a British Pakistani black hat hacker and propagandist uh, with a nom de plume Abu Hussain al Britanni, who supported the Islamic State, so called Islamic State. Um, so there's a Wikipedia article about him. If we click on that. Um, attempts on life and death. Uh, what does it say? Um, now, Hussein, who grew up in Birmingham in a Pakistani origin family, was jailed in 2012 for hacking Tony Blair's accounts and posting his personal information online. Um, Hussein left the UK around 2013 for Syria. Um, so you can read about him. Then Rahul Amin, um, born 1971 in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, there's an article about him in The Guardian. And it's Rahul Amin and Rayad Khan, the footballer and the boy who wanted to be the first Asian Prime Minister. Um, so this is an article in The Guardian about these two. Um, and it goes on. Telegraph article about um, Rayad Khan. So, I mean, obviously, with what's happened in uh, Manchester, what happened uh, on Westminster Bridge, um, and this ongoing um, radical Islamicist. Um, infiltration um, into you know British communities uh, we can see that um, that you know there is a problem with this radicalization and, and um, clearly you know people you know can't you know we can't ignore it of course we can't um, and people I've seen online uh, will say that people like Tommy Robinson are, you know, they're this and that. I've looked at quite a lot of his videos and uh, interviews, um, and it's got to be said that I, I don't take away from those videos um, all of these accusations people make against him. He, he's quite specific, but there's a... Uh, a problem related to Islamicist extremism. Now in terms of the terminology here, what I always like to say is that um, Zionism is a political ideology, it's not Judaism. There were extremist Christian factions in the Lebanon uh, during uh, the civil war there for instance. Oh, clearly there are Islamicist um, Islamism uh, based ideologies that is corrupting young men um, who are becoming convinced, brainwashed I would say, into committing atrocities. Now there's a professor in Chicago um, and uh, he's Professor Pape is his name and let me just get this up here um, because I would like to um, just tackle this political aspects of um, organized religion or state religion uh, which is not um, actually in line with the faith of you know, believers in the religions. There's there's a very there's there's a long history going back into the depths of time uh, of um, broad faith groupings being um, co-opted for political ends, and um, it happened with Christ with Christianity um, in the rule of Constantine. So. 
in around 430 AD, I think it was, um, Constantine converted to Christianity and that's when the church became founded in Rome uh, and about I don't know, I think about 600 years later there was then the schism between the Orthodox Roman Catholic Church and the uh, church in Rome uh, and that, that was a political argument they had some arguments about you know uh, religious doctrine but it was really about the power structures um, and uh, the Orthodox Christian Church wanted a decentralized structure and the Pope in Rome wanted to be infallible and in charge and um, so that was the cause of the split it was a political split uh, you know going on later then obviously you have Henry VIII and disestablishing from the Roman Church and forming the Church of England so that he could divorce and remarry um, and then that led into um, all sorts of political um, differences uh, related to um, Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans um, who believed in uh, something called I'm so this is all off the top of my head um, so, so you know forgive me for getting a few dates wrong a couple of details wrong uh, but but what they they were arguing about was that the king Charles the first wanted to be have the divine rights of, of kings and a lot of this goes back to you know uh, kings ruling as of right you know with, with the blessing of God, as it were, um, and the Puritans saying, no, you, you know, uh, God doesn't stand behind the king. Um, and and uh, there, there are doctrines in the Christian faith to do with divine rights of kings and uh, so forth. Um, so anyway, Robert Pape, on this political point, uh, published a book called Dying to Win, which was the first, and as far as I know, one of the last really detailed inquiries into uh, suicide terrorism. People criticised it, other people felt that he had a point. I personally feel he has a point. Um, and uh, just to read this bit, uh, Papes Dying to Win, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism, 2005, contradicts mainly widely held beliefs about suicide terrorism based on an analysis of every known case of suicide terrorism from 1980 to 2003, um, 315 attacks part of 18 campaigns. He concludes that there is little connection between suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism or any one of the world's religions. Rather, that nearly all suicide terrorist attacks have in common is a specific secular and strategic goal to compel modern democracies to withdraw military forces from territory that the terrorists consider to be their homeland. The taproot of suicide terrorism is nationalism, he argues. It is an extreme strategy for national liberation. Um, Pape's work examines groups such as Al-Qaeda and the Sri Lankan Tamil Tigers. Pape also notably provides further evidence to a growing body of literature that finds that the majority of suicide terrorists do not come from impoverished or uneducated backgrounds, but rather have middle class origins and a significant level of education. Um, well, I mean, we can see that with the recent uh, suicide attack. Um, and this idea that they hate our democracy, they hate our freedoms, um, is false. Um, what, what it is, is that it's, it's a political thing which is justified through skewed um, religious doctrine. And there was a fatwa um, published in... I think it was 2000, by a esteemed 
uh, Islamic cleric who, 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 you know, basically says, and lots of Muslims, I know lots of Muslims, and they all, you know, they agree with this, that their, their Islamic teachings, from their imams and from their understanding, um, you know, you don't go around blowing up innocence. Um, so, but there are some people that believe that it's the right thing to do and that actually counts as jihad. Now, I'm not a bleeding heart liberal apologist for this. I mean, I, I stand against um, Islamicist terrorism and stand against the, um, you know, the, this sort of political terrorism. Um, but it, it, it's political terrorism and nationalist. Now, Islam is a very broad church. I mean, churches generally are very broad churches. Um, but even within the broad church of, of Islam, uh, those preaching this sort of hate preaching fall outside of the religious scholarship. What they uh, so 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 there's a difference between justification of an act um, and uh, the the truth or faith basis of an act uh, and um, unfortunately there's a long history of political um, power structures justifying uh, terrorist aims through uh, doctrine and that's what we see here and clearly the Saudi government our princes of Saudi government, or you know the royal family there, funding um, Salafi, uh, Wahhabi uh, teachings, which is a a minority um, Sunni of Islam sect, and then this comes. From there, so I mean, Tommy Robinson is right about the political is Islamicist, and he's right about how um, these people are, are hidden in bed; they're embedded within communities. Um, and so you've got then you've got the, you've got the terrorism. The other thing then you have is the sexual predation and the sex gangs, and. Um, the problem in Rotherham has, has, has come out and there, it's a widespread uh, problem which politicians have not been prepared to talk about and that's political correctness and that does come from uh, a lot of bleeding heart left liberal type of attitudes um, and this insistence on policing other people's speech and calling people uh, racists, fascists, Nazis, all sorts, every name under the sun, uh, to stop them from actually articulating uh, what should be articulated and should be dealt with. And it's, um, it's despicable that someone's free speech should be attacked. Um, and uh, not only... Even if I thought Tommy Robinson was this terrible Nazi, uh, you know, rabid, hating person, which I don't, but even if he was, was, I would defend his right to say way more than he actually says. I mean, he, he's, I think he's a nice bloke. I mean, I really do. And, uh, um, He's very articulate, but he's articulating a very unpopular view with the political power structures. Now on that, if there was just something I wanted to mention about the Muslim Brotherhood um, and uh, the strands of um, political Islam, because the Muslim Brotherhood came out of the Egyptian Arab nationalist movement. There's a very good film about that, which is done by um, 
Adam Curtis, um, if you watch, it's called Bitter Lake, um, and it, it really does deal with where that all came from and how uh, our secret services overthrew um, Al Nasser, who was a Arab socialist back in the 1950s, and the British and the Americans were worried about Soviet influence in that part of the world. That was the Red Menace. Now it's the, you know, it, it, it's the same thing with um, Putin, which is not the the Red Menace, but they they don't like his brand of Russian nationalism. Um, they don't like Donald Trump's brand of American nationalism either. Uh, and uh, in the same way that, say, the EU doesn't like Nigel Farage's brand of British nationalism. Now, um, Welsh nationalism and SNP or Scottish nationalism gets a different ride. Um, and I don't know why that is. I don't know why they're treated much different to, you know, Nigel Farage's brand of, of uh English nationalism, if you like, or, or in fact, if anything, Nigel Farage's is more all encompassing because it's British nationalism. Uh, obviously, um, Irish nationalism gets a bad rap, um, and the IRA, uh, so you know, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that politics and nationalism is, is fairly complicated, and then when you throw religion into the mix as a justification. For the political uh, uh, rivalries that exist and exist between elites or competing elites in those countries, pretty soon it gets pretty complicated. Um, but uh, in globalism, in neoliberalism, uh, the setting of people against each other is part of the game plan to under undermine collective labor rights um, and that that's been going on for a long time um, the history of it in the USA and in Europe is quite different um, when the USA smashed the Wobblies which was the anarchist union in Chicago um, that was really kind of curtains for uh, uh, the American labor movement, um, but the idea of um, libertarianism, if you like, I mean, I'm a left libertarian, um, and you know, we do exist, if, you know, um, I'm otherwise known as an, a, an anarchist, um, and that doesn't mean I run around dressed in black smashing windows, because I don't. Um, uh, I'm a philosophical anarchist. Uh, and uh, so I believe in things like direct action and what have you, but but um, I'm an anarchist for a bit like sort of fat, hairy Lib Dems in a way, because I, I mean you can kind of be accused of being sitting on the fence and sort of saying, well, you know, they're all wrong, the plague on all their houses, so kind of guilty. Um, but but. Um, Needless to say, it's a bit more complicated than that. So, I mean, this 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 has just been a ramble, I guess, and and uh, that's really all I wanted to say. So, solidarity with all my uh, brothers in Islam that you know, you know, worship Allah, God, and and stay true to uh, the faith. Same to all my Jewish brothers and all my Christian brothers. Um, and, well, actually, just just as a finish, I want to play the end of this poem by William Blake, which is the everlasting gospel, and uh, this kind of sums it up for me. I'll just play the last stanza. The vision of Christ that thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Thine has a great hook nose like thine, mine has a snub nose like the mine. Thine is the friend of all mankind, 
mind speaks in parables to the blind. Thine loves the same world that mine hates. Thy heaven doors are my hell gates. Socrates taught what Minotus loathed as a nation's bitterest curse, and Caiaphas was in his own mind a benefactor to mankind. Both read the Bible day and night, but thou readst black where I read white. And I think that really says it all.